hello to everyone in the US, Israel, Palestine, and in other places in the world. Uh, welcome to this latest installment of Conversations with Israel and Palestine, hosted by Partners for Progressive Israel. Conversations with Israel and Palestine is a series of informational webinars that bring voices from Israel and Palestine to an American audience, providing an important link between progressives in the US and in the Middle East. My name is Daniel Nirenberg, and I'm the Communications Manager for Just Vision, a nonprofit dedicated to increasing the power and reach of Palestinians and Israelis who are working to end the occupation and build a just, free, and equal future. Over the next 60 minutes, I'll be serving as the discussion moderator. Before we get started, uh, let me just quickly note that Partners for Progressive Israel is an American non-for-profit 501c3 organization dedicated to the achievement of a durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors and believes in the need to ensure civil rights, equality, and social justice for all of Israel's inhabitants. Partners seeks to deepen Americans, and especially American Jews' understanding of Israel's complexities in order to enhance their ability to advocate for a progressive Israeli future. Let me now just quickly introduce um, our two panelists today. Uh, Tanya Hari is the Executive Director of Gisha, the Legal Center for Freedom of Movement. Prior to joining Gisha in 2007, Tanya worked on advocacy and fundraising initiatives for not-for-profit organizations promoting human rights and development. Tanya is relied upon as a source of information and analysis on the situation in Gaza by diplomats, foreign offices, and international organizations. And Dr. Mukhemar Abu Sada is an associate professor and chairman of the Department of Political Science at Al Azhar University in Gaza. He received his PhD from the University of Missouri, Columbia in 1996. Since that time, he has authored one book as well as several academic articles and short essays. And before we get started, let me just add that the discussion is going to go on for about 40 minutes, after which time we'll be answering questions from the video audience. So I encourage those of you who are tuned in right now to type in your questions at any time. All you need to do is look at the bottom of your monitor for the icon that reads Q&A. You might need to touch your screen or just ho hover over it to click on it. Click on the icon, type your question in the small box that appears. You have the option of displaying your name or choosing anonymously. The webinar won't disappear or be disrupted. Um, please note that viewers' microphones are turned off and questions can only be asked when typed in this way. So let's get started. And um, I think it would be valuable to start with a sort of context setting. Um, it's a question for, for both of you. Um, though, Tanya, I, I want to touch on something you wrote last year, which is that um, in an article in the Jerusalem Post that most Israelis and many Americans think that Israel left Gaza in 2005 when it pulled its troops and settlers from the territory. Few realize that Israel still controls almost every aspect of life there. So I was hoping you could touch a little bit on that. Um, what that uh, matrix of control looks like, um, how it affects people's lives. Um, and it's a question for both of you, uh, Tanya, in terms of your work, um, as, as a role of professor at Al Azhar um, and in your personal life, to, to touch on some of those aspects. Tanya, I'm not able to hear you. I'm not sure if you're muted. Maybe it's my headphones. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. OK, so I'll start again. Um, thanks so much uh, for uh, organizing this to Partners for Progressive Israel, to yourself, Daniel, for hosting, um, and to Mahaimar for joining. It's really exciting to be part of this discussion. I uh, never tire of talking about this subject, and I'm always surprised and happily so that other people want to take part. Um, with all of the things happening in the world that are, are, are drawing people's attention. I think, unfortunately, the situation in Gaza is not getting the attention it deserves. So I want to thank um, the participants for being part of this uh, uh, important call. Um, to touch on your question about the, the issue of control. So yeah, Gisha, uh, which means access or approach in Hebrew, uh, we were founded in 2005, precisely before the disengagement, to look at, at what Israel's responsibility would be to residents of Gaza in this new situation that would be, would be created. We knew that control wouldn't necessarily look like it does in the West Bank, um, but at the same time, anyone who was dealing with issues of occupation had a pretty good sense, and you really didn't have to be a magician or a fortune teller to know that Israel would maintain control over movement and access. Um, 
And it's not just movement and access in the sense that you can get, so over people traveling, over goods coming into and out of Gaza. It's also the sea space. It's the airspace, it's control over the Palestinian population registry. So who is even thought of as a Palestinian resident, who can be registered in the Palestinian population registry. It's access to land inside of the Strip, to um, what is Gaza's most arable farmland, a Strip right around the border fence. Um, and all of these different ways of control where you could group it as movement and access, but it really filters down into almost every aspect of day-to-day -day life. Um, I think um, Haimar can probably elaborate what it feels like from within Gaza. Um, we're working mainly on the Israeli side, looking at uh, the kind of uh, administrative uh, aspects of this control, the way um, that Israel decides what can and can't come out, who can and can't travel. Um, and then also looking, of course, at the impact, but certainly, Still to this day, um, many years later, Israel wields uh, uh, very much control and we believe owes responsibility because of that level of control. Khaymar? Okay, well, uh, thanks very much uh, for having me in this uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much, Tanya, for being uh, with me. And thank uh, you very much, Daniel, for uh, uh, being the moderator of this uh, live discussion. Um, well, let me say that as a resident of the Gaza Strip, and it's true, as just Tanya has mentioned, that uh, uh, many people around the world believe that Israel uh, has uh, disengaged from the Gaza Strip in the summer 2005, and very much as the Netanyahu government uh, is saying to the outside world that there, is no, there are no Israeli soldiers and no Israeli settlers in the Gaza Strip, and it's true, but uh, uh, still, since Israel disengaged from the Gaza Strip, Israel is surrounding the Gaza Strip from uh, three sides, uh, from the north and from the east side, and also from, uh, from uh, the sea. There is an Israeli blockade also uh, uh, besieging the Gaza Strip from the uh, sea uh, side. This Israeli siege, which was inflicted on the Gaza Strip uh, 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 right after Hamas won the Palestinian elections in January uh, 2006 and more, after Hamas seized power in the Gaza Strip in the summer of 2007, Israel has turned Gaza as the biggest open air prison on the face of earth, where our, uh, two million Palestinians live in Gaza Strip with no access and movement to the outside world, except in uh, very little cases. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Tanya, as, as uh, head of the Legal Center for Access and Movement for the Palestinians, uh, know more about this probably, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, very limited number of Palestinians are able to reach uh, the West Bank. Uh, and according to the Oslo Agreement, both the West Bank and Gaza Strip are one territorial unit. And very limited number of Palestinians are able uh, to go to the West Bank, uh, b b like business people, uh, 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 patients, and also very limited number of Palestinians are able to, to reach Israel. And, and Fortunately, on, on the other side of the borders between Gaza and Egypt, uh, the situation is not, is, isn't really much better. Uh, uh, since the new regime in Egypt came to power in the summer of two, uh, 2013, uh, Egypt uh, closed the Rafah border crossing, which is the only uh, crossing for the Palestinians between Gaza and the outside world from the Egyptian side. And it, it reopened it uh, just about uh, uh, 16 months ago after the start of the so-called the Great March of Return. Uh, in general, uh, 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 as a result of this Israeli siege and blockade of the Gaza Strip, and access and movement is, is very limited. Uh, the Palestinians in Gaza are not able to export uh, their uh, produce uh, uh, or products outside of the Gaza Strip, and that has uh, inflicted uh, uh, itself on the uh, figures in terms of poverty and unemployment in the Gaza Strip. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and according to many international agencies, uh, about uh, or even more than 70% of the 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip rely on food aid from UNRWA, United Nations Release and Works Agency, and also from WFP, World Food Program. And in addition to that, uh, more than 60%, more than 53% of the Palestinians in Gaza are unemployed. And when, when we are talking about Palestinian youth, unemployment among Palestinian youth 
is about 65 percent and uh, 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 life is uh, no longer acceptable in the Gaza Strip and let me remind you and remind your viewers that in 2012 uh, the UN issued a report that Gaza won't be a livable place in 2020 and we are already in 2019 in a few months we will be approaching 2020 and life is is a very is very miserable here in Gaza in terms of electricity, potable water, uh, 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 healthcare, schooling, uh, uh, access and movement, poverty, unemployment, and it's about I think it, it's 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 about time that someone uh, will have to step in and try to deal with those chronic problems in the Gaza Strip to try to uh, prevent a, a further humanitarian uh, disaster in Gaza. So I'd love to follow up on this, and I think this is a good segue into one of the themes of this webinar is, is taking a look at uh, how we can make life more tolerable in Gaza in the absence of an actual political process right now. Um, given that it doesn't seem as though Israel is signaling toward ending the blockade anytime soon, uh, which what do you think each of you might see as uh, ways that uh, humanitarian relief efforts can actually make significant changes short of there being uh, political movement. You want to start, Taiwan? Uh, yeah, go ahead. If you want to start on that, fine. If you want me to start, it's fine with me. Uh, whatever Why is Why don't good. you start this time and I'll follow you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, for this question. Well, it, it's true that the, the two-state uh, solution, which is only a solution on the table, which has been uh, 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 supported by the international community and by the Palestinian and the Israelis up until this moment. But unfortunately, uh, the two-state solution is just fading away uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is the expansion of Israeli settlement in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, which is uh, basically uh, uh, crippling the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian economy and also crippling the ability to have a Palestinian contiguous uh, 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 state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And also, I have to admit that the Palestinian uh, support for the two-state solution is uh, 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 getting less and less attention in the face of uh, uh, Israeli siege and blockade against Gaza, in the face of Israeli settlement expansion in the West Bank, and also in the face of uh, uh, Netanyahu's promises to his electorate uh, uh, before the Israeli elections, which were held on September 17, uh, in which he promised his uh, electorate and his constituency that uh, if he is uh, 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 elected and he is able to form an Israeli government, he will uh, annex uh, 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 the Jordan Valley and also will annex uh, uh, the settlement uh, north of the Dead Sea. That, that, that this discourse by Netanyahu and the right wing in Israel to be honest with you, is inflicting very bad on the attitude of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and their attitude toward the two-state solution. Anyway, well, let me say that we are still, we the Palestinians are still hopeful of, of a, a two-state solution. We still are supporting a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza that live in peace and security alongside the state of Israel. Uh, but to be honest with you, uh, as a uh, 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 more and more Israeli settlement units are being built in the West Bank as more and more uh, 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 roads are being built for Israeli settlers in the West Bank. It just gives a, a very uh, 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 bad signal to the Palestinians and especially to the Palestinian moderates uh, who are being uh, 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 on the marginals as a result of, of this Israeli uh, settlements and also uh, this kind of Israeli discourse is just playing in the hands of the radicals in the Palestinian side, especially Hamas and other radical Palestinian groups. Anyway, let's just uh, keep our uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, there will be a two-state solution one day, especially uh, uh, if, if Benny Gantz and the Israeli center and center-left are able to form an, a government, we will probably have to wait and see whether that is, is going to happen or not. But uh, uh, in the absence of the two-state solution, uh, uh, that puts uh, uh, more pressure on the international community to intervene. Uh, let me say that uh, 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 the Gaza Strip is, is, is suffering as a result of three parties. One is the Israeli siege and blockade against Gaza, as we have described it uh, earlier. Second, as a result of the PA punitive measures 
which have been introduced by the PA about two and a half years ago, starting from April uh, 2017, in which the PA cut down on PA salaries, uh, 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 um, cut down on the number of Palestinian patients who are referred to Israeli hospitals and to West Bank hospitals, and also sent many uh, PA uh, public servants into early retirement. As a result of that, that has led to catastrophic daily conditions for, for the Palestinians. And above, uh, above uh, that, uh, definitely uh, uh, we have to, 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 to say that uh, the two million Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip are being held hostages by Hamas, who is uh, 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 ruling as an authoritarian uh, 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 entity in, in the Gaza Strip with no uh, 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 civil liberties, no political rights. And we all remember what happened to the Palestinians who revolted against Hamas in, in March of this year and how Hamas security services have dealt with them in a very brutal way, especially against journalists, human rights activists, and against the, 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 the Palestinian uh, uh, civilians in general. Uh, let me just try to summarize uh, 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 my point here is that I think it's, 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 this is the duty of the international community to intervene, to put pressure on Israel uh, to alleviate its siege of the case against the Gaza Strip. And also, it's, it, it's the, uh, the responsibility of the international community and the EU especially, who is funding the Palestinian Authority to put pressure on the PA to alleviate its punitive measures against Gaza and uh, to try to, uh, to encourage more and more countries like Qatar, who are investing in the infrastructure, creating jobs, uh, whether it's through these countries or through the UN system here in Gaza. Thank you, Mukaimah. I have several follow-up questions, but I, I'd love to hear from Tanya first about the um, question of sort of humanitarian efforts in the absence of any kind of political movement. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I will say something about what kinds of steps can be taken. Um, I do want to say a few things about the kind of the context for the question, right? So we can talk about the kind of technical fixes that are needed to alleviate some of the major issues and problems on the ground. Um, I think before we do that, and maybe it's a bit of a disclaimer or not, we can, we can you know, decide. But I mean, I do think it's important to take a step back and acknowledge, um, if it's not obvious, that uh, what's happening in Gaza is a man-made crisis. It's not a natural disaster. Um, and that at the end of the day, um, you know, a man-made crisis has uh, man-made solutions, or as I sometimes like to say, maybe women-made solutions. Um, so I think that we should acknowledge that, you know, there are technical things that can be done and improved in the meantime. At the same time, the, the kind of broader picture is more of a strategic one. It's more of a question of what political changes need to happen, what policy changes need to happen, um, so that we're not just kind of plugging holes, you know, in, in a ship that's sinking, but we're rather kind of steering a boat to somewhere. Um, so, you know, that, that's important for me to say. Um, I will say, though, that, you know, alongside that, um, you know, organizations like Gisha, humanitarian organizations operating in the Strip, are operating in the meantime, right? We're, we're saying nothing can change until there is a political solution, until the end of the occupation. Um, but in the meantime, there are people living on the ground. There are two million people living on the ground. Um, another just point of context and to connect um, to what Mahimar said, which I very much appreciated, he acknowledged the kind of um, a number of different actors who are influencing life in the Strip and their actions are very much interconnected. And I think it's something that we don't give enough attention to. It's hard to have nuanced conversations about these things, but it's important because each actor has the ability to change um, his or her actions in the spheres in which they're operating. No one actor in this picture, not the PA, not Hamas, not Israel, not the international community, can operate alone to fix the situation. The international community certainly has a big role to play. They're providing a lot of funding. Um, they are the ones actually implementing some of these fixes but they rely on Israel to allow them to operate. They allow, allow, rely on Hamas to allow them to operate in Gaza. They rely on the PA for legitimacy to operate in Gaza. So we're talking about a number of different actors that we continuously say need to cooperate if the goal really is to improve the situation. 
So those are all my words of context. In terms of um, some of the technical things that need to happen, um, I think that most people in Gaza, um, and Mahimar, correct me if I'm wrong, if you ask them, you know, what's one of your most pressing concerns, they're going to talk about their daily lives and they're going to talk about electricity. Um, everything connects back to electricity. So I think that that is something certainly that needs to be paid attention to, the question of infrastructure. Electricity is everything. Everything is interconnected. So we're talking about, of course, um, access to water, um, the sewage uh, treatment network uh, relying on electricity. We're talking about the economy relying on electricity, the health system, schools, you know, it, it, you can go on and on. Um, and I think that right now we're in a, in a situation where things are a little bit better than they have been in the past. Um, eight, um, sometimes even 12 hours of electricity per day, where a little while ago we were just down at three to four hours per day. And that's because Qatar um, stepped in and is paying, um, you know, for fuel that is being brought in for Gaza's power plant. But that's, again, it's a temporary fix. If you're getting up to eight hours and people are breathing a sigh of relief, that's still very far from the norm um, in places like Brooklyn and Tel Aviv, um, where 24 hours of electricity is the norm and it allows our societies to function. So I think that paying attention to electricity, infrastructure needs is key. Um, if you look at the situation of the economy, um, Electricity is one input, and the other major input is movement and access. It can't be denied. I think it's something that people, um, again, sitting in Brooklyn and Tel Aviv maybe take for granted, but it's really the key to everything in your life, in your personal life, in your ability to develop as a human being, to see your family, to travel for work, et cetera, to get health care. But it's also things that are invisible to you, like the way that your uh, goods end up in your supermarket, your ability to engage in trade. Um, you know, again, I can give so many examples, but in Gaza, the economy has been held hostage for political reasons. Now, many um, people on, on this call might think, well, what about security? Isn't everything related at the end of the day to security? And unfortunately, that's not the case. I would like security to be the only bar um, you know, when, when we're talking about movement and access, and that's really far from the case. Really, so many other factors come in, including political decisions and calculations about putting pressure on the population, about protecting markets, about, uh, for example, excess products inside of Israel being dumped on the Gaza Strip. Um, so security is certainly not the only factor, um, even though it should be. Um, so that's the economy. What we can do, we can remove barriers on trade, we can remove barriers on exit of goods going to their primary markets, which used to be the West Bank and, and Israel. Some products are going to the West Bank, very few products are going to Israel. We think we could see an expansion of that really with a decision made overnight um, uh, uh, to expand those markets. Um, when it comes to, um, I, I think, the kind of situation for daily life, um, something that is very far from a technical fix um, and something that I think is not addressed enough is how people feel on the ground. And um, Mahaymar talked about this kind of feeling that um, the two-state solution is maybe slipping, um, uh, you know, from, from, from the radar. Um, I think my sense is that people in Gaza feel um, not just that the two-state solution is, is slipping, but just in general that, that there is anything coming that's positive, that there's any solution on the horizon for them. Um, whether technical fixes, again, to the problems I mentioned, the electricity, the economy, et cetera, or a kind of broader um, vision of what their future might look like. And, and I think that um, something that we really need to do um, as Israelis, as Palestinians in the international community is restore hope um, for young people, especially um, to say that they are seen, that they are heard, that Gaza is part of the picture, that there are two million people living there um, and, and that they will be taken into account, that they will not be forgotten. And I think that this is, again, it's, it's not a, the question of the humanitarian per se. It's not things that are normally measured, you know, you can't really measure hope. Um, but I do think that it's an important factor in what's happening on the ground um, today. And it's something that we need to pay attention to. Thank you both for those insights. Um, 
quickly, I want to thank those people who have already sent in questions. Um, and a reminder for those who haven't, you can click on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. You can send in those questions at any time. We'll be turning to the Q&A period in about 12 minutes or so. Um, so I am uh, I'm curious about this question around hope. We've talked a lot about the humanitarian situation. There are potentially shifts on the political horizon. We have no idea what they're going to look like. Israel might be turning toward a third election in the past 12 months. And Abbas recently announced uh, the possibility of legislative elections. It's not the first time that he's announced elections. Uh, my understanding in, in speaking with a colleague from Gaza is that uh, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip don't really have any hope that these Palestinian elections are going to lead to anything. Um, there's still a sense that the rift between Hamas and Fatah is too deep. Um, and there's also a big question mark about whether these elections will actually happen. And so I'd love to get a sense from the perspective of both of these elections of whether there's anything on the horizon that seems um, hopeful. And if there isn't, what it is that, um, you know, we either at the grassroots from the policy community, from the international community can be doing to counter what looks like um, uh, a less than hopeful future. Well, uh, thank you, Daniel. But let me uh, let me try to answer this question in, in a very short way. Uh, well, let me start saying uh, uh, that that hope is the only thing that keeps uh, uh, many people like me in the Gaza Strip. To be honest with you, if we lose hope, uh, it means that uh, people are just going to leave. And, and, and it, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 thousands of Palestinian uh, youth have left the Gaza Strip in the past uh, two years, especially uh, in the past two years, and, and many even uh, before that. And to the best of my knowledge, there are tens of thousands of Palestinians who are left at the Gaza Strip. They are already in Turkey. Some of them have already reached Europe uh, because uh, they have lost hope. Uh, they don't believe that there, there's going to be any future for them in the Gaza Strip. And this, if this case continues as it is right now, if this pattern continues, uh, that that is a very alarming uh, 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 thing uh, to the uh, uh, future of the Palestinians in Gaza and to the uh, ability of the two million Palestinians uh, to survive in the Gaza Strip. Uh, speaking of, of Palestinian elections, uh, I, 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 it, it, it's something that we all the Palestinians are calling for. We are pressing for uh, presidential and parliamentary elections because the last time uh, elections were held in Palestine were in January uh, 2006. And as a matter of fact, and according to the Palestinian basic law, we should have uh, held uh, at least three uh, elections in the past uh, 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 13 years or so, since 2006 until now. But let me tell you that uh, we, we are not very uh, optimistic about the possibility of holding elections in the, in the West Bank and Gaza for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the Palestinian uh, president has indicated that he's going to call for only legislative elections for now, and uh, six months later, he will probably call for, uh, for presidential election. That, that is not acceptable by Hamas at all. Hamas is saying that uh, with, uh, either there is going to be uh, elections for the presidency and for the legislative branch, or there will be no elections. That's one thing. Second, uh, 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 there are many voices here in the Palestinian territories and especially in the Gaza Strip about the day after elections. What if Hamas wins again? Now, there is no dispute about the fact that Hamas will uh, lose miserably in the Gaza Strip when we are, if we are going to take uh, into consideration the daily life situation uh, uh, to the two million Palestinians in Gaza. And there is no uh, dispute about the fact that Hamas is going to lose in a very bad way in Gaza. But uh, the possibility of Hamas winning in the West Bank is a different thing. Uh, uh, based on student council elections, syndicate elections, and other elections in the West Bank, uh, Fatah and the PA aren't doing really that well. Uh, still, the PA is, is, is uh, uh, haunted uh, with corruption, the stalemate of the peace process. Uh, 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 and, and, and other thing, it doesn't indicate that Fatah will uh, probably or, uh, even, even uh, win in, 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 in the West Bank. So uh, the Palestinians are saying, before we go into elections, we the Palestinians have to agree on the day after election, because we don't want to find ourselves in the same position we found ourselves in the post-2006 elections, when Hamas won the elections and the international community refused to accept the results of the elections, isolated Hamas, 
and the PA at that time, and, and uh, Israel also suspended the transfer of Palestinian taxes and customs. And uh, the third issue here is that uh, uh, that makes a uh, Palestinian election uh, 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 in, in question is uh, uh, will Israel allow the Palestinians in East Jerusalem to participate in, in any Palestinian future legislative elections, especially after the U.S. has recognized Jerusalem as the eternal capital of Israel and has moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So uh, there are a number of questions which makes the Palestinians unsure that elections will be held. And uh, uh, the other thing, as, I, as I'm trying to say to you, is that uh, probably elections is not the solution. I think uh, uh, we, we, we really in need for Palestinian national dialogue to try to settle and to reach uh, uh, an understanding, or as we call it in Arabic, yani, uh, mitaq sharaf, or uh, 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 an honor uh, uh, agreement or, or consensus and to, re to respect uh, uh, basic rights of the Palestinians and to respect the results of any future elections in the Palestinian territories. Thank you, Mukhaimar. Uh, Tanya, do you want to touch on that? Um, Yes, I mean, look, I, I tend to be a fairly optimistic person. Um, so I always tell people that they should take my analysis with a grain of salt, um, because I'm always really kind of scratching for, um, you know, the optimistic view of any situation. Um, but maybe I'll start with, with what's not good news. Um, I think, you know, it, it does seem to me like we will be going to third elections. Um, like you started off saying, everything is kind of open. I don't think that we can really know what's going to happen, um, but it does seem seem like that that's what's happening in Israel. Um, I'm not very hopeful that um, either a government uh, formed by Netanyahu or by um, opposition, you know, the, what, what would have been the opposition leader, Benny Gantz, would be significantly different on this particular issue. Um, I don't see really divergent views um, uh, between them or, you know, between people who are, are, are part of their parties. Um, and, and I don't think either of them have really articulated a, a vision for what, what is going to happen, um, you know, once, once they form a government. Um, the other negative side of that is I do think that there are people who are determined to implement um, a certain vision in this region. And I think that that vision is based on uh, a concept of uh, fragmenting the Palestinian population. And we're, we've already seen it being implemented over a number of decades. Um, and the piece of Gaza is, is the isolation of Gaza. Um, Hamas coming to power certainly uh, sealed the deal, um, but well before Hamas came to power, we already saw um, extreme restrictions on, on movement, inability to travel um, between Gaza and the West Bank to relocate um, from Gaza to the West Bank, things like student travel already being banned in the year 2000. Um, and I think that all of these uh, 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 kind of tools of separation have, have really led us to where we are today and have also paved the way for a vision of um, uh, maybe a different kind of two-state solution than what we've seen in the past, which would be Israel and the West Bank as one entity and Gaza as a separate entity. Um, so that's, that's the bad um, news from, from my perspective. I think that there is a slight bit of optimism um, and, and it depends on, on um, people who are values driven, I think, to kind of wedge, wedge it open. And that is something that's been happening uh, recently. And Benny Gantz has uh, articulated uh, views on this and so has Netanyahu. And that's um, them talking about bringing stability to Gaza. So you'll often hear people say that neither of the parties want another war. Um, they don't want another military operation. Um, and from my perspective, Israel is managing the situation in a way to keep things quiet, to keep things calm. Now, like I said, there is no strategic vision um, necessarily for what happens uh, in the long term. Um, at the same time, what we're seeing is a kind of um, desire to keep 
the pot of water very, very hot, but keep it from boiling. And so in order to do that, we see Israel implementing certain measures, which people refer to maybe as easing measures when it comes to Gaza. Um, for example, expanding the fishing zone uh, in the last year, um, adding more permits for traders or even laborers recently. Um, and and I, I think that this indicates not a, a kind of um, contradiction in terms. So I had said before they want to put pressure on the population. So you could say, well, why are they then expanding the fishing zone? And no, actually, these things very much go together because the idea is to put pressure on but not keep the situation from exploding. And why is that optimistic? Again, I'm like really scratching here for the optimism, but I think the, the idea is how do, we, how do we break this open more? How do we take this from a place that says that it's not okay to experiment with people's lives? It's not okay just to manage the situation. People in, in Gaza, um, in the West Bank as well, deserve to live. They deserve not just to survive, but to thrive. And this is what it looks like, and this is what needs to happen. So I think it's about recognizing the situation on the ground and not being satisfied just with a few more nautical miles or just with a few more hours of electricity, but in continuing to demand a very, very high standard, not saying the humanitarian situation is good enough as it is if people aren't openly dying in the streets. It's saying that people have the right to uh, aspire to the highest standard of living possible. Um, and I think as civil society organizations, certainly we have a role to play in articulating this vision. Um, and, and, and frankly, not being okay with the status quo as is. Thank you. Thank you for, for offering uh, a glimmer of hope in, in dark times. And certainly, I think glimmer. grounding in, in <laughs> values and in civil society efforts um, and in grassroots efforts to be uh, holding those values up, I think is really crucial. Um, I had several follow-up questions, but the, the Q&A questions are, are coming in and several of them touch on questions that I wanted to ask. So um, we're going to turn now with about 20 minutes left on uh, the webinar to some of those questions. Um, there is still time to send in questions. So for those of you who um, haven't sent something in yet and would like to, you still have a chance. Um, so I'll start with um, uh, one question on access and movement. Actually, there's two questions that are somewhat related, and so we'll, we'll tie them together. Um, Carrie Nelson asks, what do you think the odds are that the Rafah crossing will remain open long term? Um, and Howie Schneider asks, how are young people able to leave Gaza and where are they going to? Um, so I would, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, responses to those things. I know that uh, in conversations with colleagues of mine in, in Gaza, the Rafah crossing is open and it's not open. Um, this is what he keeps reminding me. So, so I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit uh, more on that context. Okay. Uh, can I start on that question? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Rafah was closed uh, uh, very much until uh, May of 2018, and it was uh, uh, opened by the Egyptians after about uh, a month and a half after the start of the March of uh, the Great March of Return. And uh, very much between 2013 and, when, and May 2018, uh, Rafah crossing was very much closed and it was opened two or three days every, every two or three months. A very, lim very limited number of Palestinians were able to move in and out of Gaza during those years. And, and to be honest with you, the situation right now is much better than what it used to be between 2013 and 20, May 2018. Um, but let me say that Egypt uh, uh, opened Rafah crossing as a result of, of the uh, deteriorating human, humanitarian situation in Gaza after the start of the Great March of Return. And second, it was opened uh, after the Egyptians uh, reached the conclusion that Palestinian reconciliation is dead and uh, our chances of reviving Palestinian reconciliation aren't, aren't really that good. And also it was open after Hamas had given pledges to the Egyptians that they will be, uh, they will try to control uh, 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 the, the human trafficking in, uh, in, in the tunnels between Gaza and, and Egypt. Uh, so it came as a result of mutual security understandings between Hamas and the Egyptians, uh, which uh, 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 at, the, at the end of the day uh, 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 alleviated the, the daily pressures on the two million Palestinians in Gaza. And since uh, 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 that, 
open, uh, Rafah is open five days a week uh, between Sunday and Thursday, and around 300 uh, to 350 people uh, are able to leave from Gaza on daily basis uh, to Egypt, and from Egypt they make it to the outside world. Uh, but still, there are thousands of Palestinians who are registered uh, uh, to, to, to travel or to leave Gaza, and they have to wait uh, uh, on average about two to three months to reach uh, 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 their their time to be able to leave to leave Gaza. So still, the the, the situation is not completely resolved or completely uh, uh, good for for the two million Palestinians. Now, uh, can we expect that Rafah will be open for a long time? I think it all depends on the security situation in Sinai. Uh, 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 still, the Egyptian army is battling uh, the radicals or Salafists or especially the Islamic State in Sinai. Overall, uh, 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 the, the situation in the past a year and a half is, 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 I think, under the control of the Egyptian army, in spite of the fact that a number of terrorist activities or terrorist attacks were held by ISIS against the Egyptian army. So still, uh, the Egyptians are uh, managing the situation, and that's why they are still keeping Rafah uh, open uh, uh, for the Palestinians. Uh, with regard to the question on how come thousands of Palestinians were able to leave Gaza and uh, that they are located in Turkey and other countries. Uh, this is the result of the opening of Rafah. Uh, now, now, this is, uh, some people say that uh, the opening of Rafah is a good thing and others are saying that this is a bad thing, that as a result of the opening of Rafah, thousands of Palestinian youth have already left Gaza on a one-way uh, trip uh, with, with no, uh, uh, no hopes of, of bringing them back because of uh, poverty, unemployment, and, and, and the other problems which we have discussed in this uh, webinar. Um, but overall, uh, I think uh, 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 Rafah will, will stay open and we will probably see more and more uh, people uh, leaving Gaza uh, uh, to Egypt. Uh, from Egypt, they make it to Turkey. Uh, whether they are able to make it to Europe or not, uh, uh, some have succeeded in doing that. But uh, uh, when you ask the Palestinians, uh, this is a very uh, uh, lengthy trip. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, deadly trip. Some people, and as a matter of fact, uh, some Palestinians uh, uh, lost their lives in their trip from Gaza to you. And uh, when you ask uh, Palestinian youth about their uh, 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 about their, what what they are why they are doing this, the answer we that they say that they are already dead in Gaza. So. When they leave Gaza and try to find a better life, if they make it, that's a good thing. If they don't make it, they have nothing because they believe that they are already dead in Gaza and there is no future in Gaza. Thank you, Mkhemer. Um, Tanya, would you like to touch a little bit on, on the question of Rafa or access and movement, broadly speaking, or where Palestinians are going, which was one of the other questions that was asked? Sure. Sure. I mean, just to just to add, I mean, I, I think Kaymar covered it very, very well. Um, I think just to highlight for um, people who are who are on the call, um, you know, Rafa, of course, doesn't connect uh, to the West Bank and, and certainly not to Israel. So Rafa is an important uh, access point to the outside world, um, but it can't connect Palestinians to other Palestinians in the West Bank and to the relatively resource rich uh, West Bank, um, we bring up often the issue of universities. So in the past, when students wanted to study subjects that weren't available in Gaza, they would go and study them in the West Bank. We're talking about an hour, two hours drive, um, you know, which is a, a pretty normal thing for, for many people to do uh, in other parts of the world. Of course, um, in, in Gaza, it's now easier to get to, to Turkey, to China, uh, to the U.S. than it is to, to get to Ramallah, um, which I think, again, is a statement about how deep the separation um, is um, uh, between Gaza and the West Bank. In terms of where young people are going, I mean, I think that you can imagine the situation of desperation created opportunities for people who um, were willing to take advantage of that desperation. So there is, of course, the issue of people paying um, for uh, for the ability to travel via Rafa crossing to kind of improve their place on the list and travel faster. Um, issues of people 
you know, purchasing visas, things like that, um, and really going anywhere that they can. Of course, Palestinians need visas to go to most places um, in the world. And so, you know, we're not talking about a gate that's just open that anyone can travel. You really do need to still meet kind of criteria. Um, you need a visa to a third country. Egyptians do not want Palestinians being inside of Egypt. Um, so there's still a, a number of kind of hurdles that people would, would face. Um, but we do know of, of um, young people who have traveled um, to Europe. You may have seen reports that um, in Belgium recently it was reported that um, after uh, Syrians, uh, people from Gaza are the, the next largest group of people asking for asylum. And a lot of countries, um, now things are shifted a bit, but countries started granting people asylum from Gaza, recognizing how um, troubled the situation has, how dangerous it is to be inside of Gaza, which is a new development just in the last years. Um, I think now there's a bit of a pushback. We are hearing about several European countries um, pushing back, trying to send people back to Gaza, trying to prevent them from reaching uh, access points that they had. Um, and so I do think that we'll see a change and maybe even a slowdown in, in this kind of exodus. Though I do think that, that we will see people who are trying um, out of this desperation to, to, to just go really anywhere that they can. Mm -hmm. Thanks to both of you for that that deeper context. Um, and I think the question of this of the frustration that's driving some people to leave uh, leads well into another question um, from Diane Shemas, who says that having spent three months at a time for six years in the Gaza Strip, I'm familiar with the effect of the 13 years Israeli siege on the material infrastructure. My question concerns if Gazans feel that the great march of return has been an effective political tool of resistance to, to lift the siege and procure human rights, or rather just a political ploy by Hamas to gain greater control over the population. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this question. As for Diane, uh, um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm not uh, really sure uh, my answer to this question will be uh, considered a neutral answer or not. Uh, let me say that uh, 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 the Palestinian uh, uh, participation in the so-called the Great March of Return uh, wasn't uh, very much pushed by Hamas at the beginning. Uh, to be honest with you, what I know to the best of my knowledge and from being here in Gaza, uh, 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 the Great March started as a, a, a non-partisan uh, Palestinian uh, uh, gathering or Palestinian movement to try to bring the attention of the international community or to the uh, 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 neighboring countries that there is a humanitarian uh, problem in Gaza. There is uh, a serious problem here in Gaza in terms of access movement, and movement, uh, poverty, unemployment, electricity, as, as Tania uh, 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 really uh, uh, pushed on that, especially in the past, we used to get three or four hours of electricity per day. Now it's, it's much better. So the Palestinians used uh, the Great March of Return to try to, to, to uh, make the international community uh, uh, to alert the international community uh, uh, to be uh, to know what is happening in Gaza and that the situation is unsustainable. Now, uh, 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 the Palestinians felt that uh, this uh, uh, non-violent protest will be a way of putting pressure on Israel, putting pressure on the Israeli army uh, 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 to alleviate the daily conditions of the Palestinians in Gaza. Now, I have to admit and say that the Palestinians succeeded in uh, uh, making the issue of the Israeli siege and blockade of Gaza uh, 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 as the uh, uh, center stage of international and regional politics. And even uh, uh, the US and the White House uh, have uh, propo has proposed a number of initiatives. Uh, uh, there was a, a workshop that was held in the White House in, I think, March of 20. Uh, 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 19 and also other uh, uh, attention by other international uh, 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 agencies that the situation has to be has to be resolved in Gaza as a result of the uh, 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 the Great March of Return. But uh, I have to be honest with you that the price that the Palestinians have paid, uh, Diane, over the past uh, year and a half is a very uh, 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 heavy price, uh, more than. Uh, uh, or almost 300 Palestinians have been killed uh, in the past 18 months. And in addition to that, there are thousands of Palestinians who have been injured, and many of them uh, uh, 
uh, have become handicapped, losing uh, their legs or their uh, uh, hands or, or being, uh, uh, they have, they, they ended up uh, uh, losing uh, uh, parts of their bodies as a result of, of the Israeli army using live ammunition against uh, Palestinian uh, protesters. At the end of the day, uh, uh, let me say that Hamas, uh, in a way, hijacked this, this protest by uh, uh, influencing and manipulating the protesters on their own, for their own agenda. When Hamas wants the protesters to go uh, to the eastern border between Gaza and Israel and to protest against the Israelis, uh, they do that. And whenever the Qataris intervene and bring uh, their uh, money to the Gaza Strip, Hamas is able to manipulate the Palestinian uh, uh, civilians, not to, or even if they go, uh, they are under the control of Hamas. There is no dispute about the fact that Hamas is now in very much in full control of the Great March of Region, but this is not how it started. It started, as I mentioned, as a grassroots Palestinian movement to try to bring the attention of the international community to the suffering of the two million Palestinians in Gaza. Thank you, Mukhamar. Uh Tanya, did you want to touch on this, on the question of the Great Return March, or do we want to try to tackle a couple other questions? Yeah, I'm fine to move on to other okay. questions. Great. Um, so we have a question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, while it is true that Hamas and the PA have a role to play in both maintaining the dire situation and being part of any positive solution or improving the situation, what I hear is that Israel has total control and is the power broker writ large. Analysis I've also heard is that the Israeli authorities really don't want to improve the situation in Gaza. Their intent is to manage the crisis, keep Gazans, quote, unquote, on a diet, and to occasionally mow the lawn. Given this reality, what is the role of the international community vis-a-vis -vis Israel in terms of improving the situation? So I guess this is a broader question about how the international community can be putting pressure on Israel, given that the most significant policy move ultimately will come down to Israel's choices. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, I think, look, I think being um, clear eyed and aware of what's being done on the ground is a first step. Um, because I think, you know, this uh, reference to being on a diet is certainly uh, a reference to um, something that Gisha exposed a number of years ago, which was a kind of willingness to count calories in Gaza and to control the entrance of food items um, to the strip. And, and that was certainly true um, of a certain period up until 2010 when, when everyday kind of items were blocked from entering. Um, right now, I mean, I think you could maybe characterize it as a certain kind of diet, but, but I, it is important for me to clarify that there are no restrictions on entrance of food. What we're talking about is um, controls over the economy and the tools of the economy, namely movement of people, movement of, of goods, um, into and out of the strip, um, and that you know uh, leads to food insecurity because people can't afford necessarily to purchase food. So may maybe you could say it's a, a technicality, but I do think it's an important thing for us to be to be very clear on the details. Um, I do think that it's important for the international community to use its leverage. Um, it's certainly true that without international aid, without the support that is flowing into the Gaza Strip from a number of different countries, we would be in a di different situation. We would be having a different conversation. Um, aid is very much propping up the situation. I think it's a very false uh, kind of sense of stability that there is in the Strip today. Um, like Mahaymar uh, mentioned earlier, about 70% of the population uh, relying on, on humanitarian aid, including food aid. So if that aid disappears, we're, we're, we're in a very desperate situation. And so I think that the fact that the international community is essentially footing the bill, they're essentially keeping the population alive, um, should um, give them a lot more ground to speak openly about the fact that this situation is unsustainable. And um, the sense I have increasingly is that um, there is quite a bit of fatigue in the international community. Um, crises elsewhere are drawing the international community's attention. Certainly um, in the US, you have your own uh, issues that you're, you're dealing with and following domestically. 
and that um, the, the situation of Israel-Palestine is less and less central, it's less and less important. For the moment, um, the aid situation is more or less stable, certainly after many countries rallied after the U.S. pulled its support for UNRWA. But that situation, I imagine, is not uh, sustainable. And I do think that the international community has a responsibility not just to throw money at the problem and not just to pull money from the problem, but to actually articulate a clear vision for what needs to happen. And Gisha doesn't have a position on the political solution to the, to the conflict, but we very much have a position on the question of people's human rights, on, on the question of dignity, um, on the question of how people can live their lives. And so I think that um, there is much that can be done as we noted in this conversation that could transform the situation. Even absent the broader kind of political questions, I think that the international community could be doing quite a bit more um, to demand, for example, greater movement and access that would allow the economy to function, would allow infrastructure to function, would allow people to live their lives uh, with dignity. Thank you. Um, we're going to try to make time for one more question because um, I think it's an important one. Uh, we know that women are disproportionately affected by conflict and war. And so uh, Tali Kritzman Amir asks, can you talk about the gendered implications of the situation in Gaza? To either one of you. Well, uh, let me start on that. Uh, um, let me say that the Palestinian society is um, in general part of the so-called uh, uh, Arab society in which uh, we do have the same uh, customs and, and, and values that are widespread in, in the Arab region, which very much discriminate against women. Uh, but I think that uh, women rights and the status of women in the Palestinian territories in general is, is uh, uh, much better than many Arab uh, countries around us in the region. Uh, but when we speak about uh, the status in, in the Gaza Strip, I have to admit that uh, uh, women in the Gaza Strip are very much restricted in, in many aspects of life. Even though that uh, 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 the status of women when it comes to a right to education and right to health and, and access and, and movement uh, in Gaza is, is very much uh, no different from uh, right, rights of men. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, Still, uh, when we are speaking of a very conservative society, uh, uh, women in the Gaza Strip are very much uh, 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 overlooked uh, by, by uh, uh, security agencies or uh, security police and, and, and uh, other, other uh, agencies. Uh, uh, but I think it, 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 women in, in the Gaza Strip in, in particular and in Palestine in general, they still have a long way to go uh, to get equal rights uh, in, 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 in Palestine. Uh, even though uh, the Pal Palestinian women have paid uh, also a very heavy price uh, uh, in, the, in, in, in their struggle against the Israeli occupation, fighting alongside uh, Palestinian men uh, uh, and, 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 uh, for uh, uh, self-determination and for uh, national emancipation, but still uh, Palestinian women, uh, especially in Gaza, haven't uh, 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 haven't uh, uh, reached or haven't uh, 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 received the, the, the dignity and honor and respect that they should get uh, 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 in return for their uh, fight against the occupation and for their uh, outspoken uh, uh, in Gaza, especially against uh, 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 um, authoritarian rule by Hamas and, 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 and its security services. I have to admit and say that Palestinian women in Gaza are in the in the front line when there are uh, uh, protests or uh, uh, marches against Hamas and against uh, uh, the 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 uh, authoritative uh, uh, rule by Hamas in the Gaza Strip. But as I mentioned, in general, we still uh, I believe, in my opinion, that uh, Palestinian women still have a long way to go uh, to get their equal rights compared to men in in Palestine and in Gaza. Thank you, Mechemar. Uh, I have a minute? Yes, you have a minute. Go for it. <laughs> okay. I do want to say, um, just to add to that, I mean, Gisha, this is a subject that is uh, near and dear to us, and we will be publishing, I hope shortly, um, a gendered analysis of the criteria on movement of people. Um, mm. So I do very much agree when it 
when you look at the, the, the issue of access, you can find all kinds of ways that women end up being discriminated against, even maybe it's not on purpose. Um, but just to give one example, we touched both of us on the issue of permits for what are, are referred to as business people or traders. They're actually many of them day laborers, which is an issue un, unto itself. Um, but unfortunately, women, professional women who are working um, in civil society and small businesses, they're, they're not eligible for permits for professional reasons. It's simply not a criteria. It's not a category that you can apply for a permit. So we routinely see women who are denied access for meetings, for trainings, certainly for education, like I mentioned. And, and I think that this is something that, again, in, if we're talking about kind of quick solutions, this is something that can change overnight with a, a policy decision. And I think it really has nothing to do with Israel's security. Um, and it has everything to do with how we can take steps to improve the situation for everyone in the region. Thank you, Thank you Tanya, for that. Um, we are at the end of our webinar. I want to thank um, both of you, Mukhimar Abu Sada and Tanya Hari, for um, joining us, for offering your insights. I learned a lot on this, and I hope that our audience members did as well. Um, so thank you for all of you for joining us on this conversation, uh, um, in, the, in the Conversation with Israel and Palestine series. I want to thank um, our panelists and also to the staff of Partners for Progressive Israel for their work in making this discussion happen. You can go to progressiveisrael.org to learn more about Partners for Progressive Israel and their future programs. Thanks so much to everyone. Take care. Thank you.